Welcome back to a 124 letters from Seneca to his mentee Lucilius. Today we're delving into letter 9, which is on philosophy and friendship. Look, if you've watched the other letters or read the articles about those letters, then go ahead and subscribe to this channel, like this video, and comment below which idea you found to be the most valuable. Today's letter, letter 9, I'm going to be delving into about three to five ideas. And letter 9 actually has a few new people that appear in this that Seneca references and, and quotes. So we're going to jump into the letter now. I'm going to take different parts of it and extract the lessons. So he starts off by Epicurus rebuking Stilbo. Epicurus is quite interesting and you've probably heard of him in your readings or videos you've watched. He basically is quite a popular philosopher because in his time he actually created a school called the Garden and what he taught was equanimity. You know, he believed in peace and he believed in freedom from worry and that's what he taught and I think that's why he's so popular and he gets quoted quite a lot in these letters. Stilbo is mentioned in letter 9 and he was interested in logic and dialects and Stilbo sort of had a morbid view on the universe according to some that the way he looked at the universe was that it was concrete and that as people we're not connected we're just here and we go in some extent I guess he's right however some people feel that that might be a bit morbid because Stilbo when his country got taken he actually lost his wife and his kids and some say he ended up living a happy life after that some say he didn't but it's clear what his point of view and his approach was so he says Epicurus Epicurus he rebukes those who hold that the wise man is self-sufficient and for that reason does not stand in need of friendships he then the letter progresses in Seneca's words and he says our ideal wise man feels his troubles but overcomes them. Their wise man does not even feel them. But we and they alike hold this idea, that the wise man is self-sufficient. Nevertheless, he desires friends, neighbors, and associates, no matter how much he is sufficient unto himself. The letter then progresses on Seneca quoting Hikato, saying, Hikato said, if you would be loved, then love. Hikato is also mentioned in these letters, and Hikato is known to be a very intense writer. In fact, he's been known to have written six treatises on good and on virtue, but apparently they didn't survive. So what Hikato is known for is that he believed that virtue can be taught, meaning good and good character and good habits can be taught. And so Hikato is mentioned a few times during these letters, including letter 9. Then he goes on to quote Atlas. Natalus says, It's more pleasant to make than to keep a friend, as it is more pleasant to the artist to paint than to have finished the painting. Atlas is someone that's quoted in this letter because Atlas was actually one of Seneca's mentors. So Seneca actually learned under Attalus and what Seneca says about him, he speaks of him quite highly, of course. He says that he's well-spoken and that he's very eloquent with his words. So essentially the, the first real lesson we learn from Seneca on philosophy and friendship letter nine is that we need connections, that, that a person should be self-sufficient, but should also have connections and friendships and I mean you know we didn't need to know that we, we that's pretty straightforward to us um, but I think in a society that's quite independent sometimes I feel that way as well uh, we need people we need good people around us and we need to have good relationships and in fact there's even been a study on it a 2011 study by I believe AJ Machen and um, RIM Dunbar which talked about the positive effects of relationships or close relationships and its effects on the neurobiological and endogenous opioid system and how that's 
a positive part of your brain and body that gets triggered that helps you feel. I'll link this study below to read it. It's quite fascinating and quite a full on read. I had to read it twice to really get it. But I mean, also scientifically we've proven that you need people. You can't be too independent, but you also need to be somewhat self-sufficient, which we go into next. The, he goes on, progresses in the letter. The wise man is self-sufficient. This phrase, my dear Lucilius, is incorrectly explained by many. For they withdraw the wise man for the, from the world and force him to dwell within his own skin. But we must mark with care what this sentence signifies and how far it applies. The wise man is, is sufficient unto himself for a happy existence, but not for mere existence. For he needs many helps towards mere existence. But for a happy existence, he needs only a sound and upright soul, one that despises fortune. And I think what he means by that is not actually despise fortune, but I guess the needing of more things. You know, I think what Seneca is alluding to here is, is being self-sufficient, mastering yourself, having good relations, and not in need of things outside yourself to make yourself feel better, or, or maybe the addiction to needing other things. The letter then goes progresses on to Seneca quoting Chrysippus. He says, Chrysippus, who declares the wise man is in want of nothing and yet needs many things. On the other hand, he says, nothing is needed by the fool or he does not understand how to use anything, but he is in want of everything. So the wise man needs hands, eyes, and many things that are necessary for his daily use but he is in want of nothing for want implies a necessity and nothing is necessary to the wise man therefore although he is self-sufficient yet he has need of friends he craves as many friends as possible not however that he may live a happy life but for he will live happily even without friends the supreme good calls for no practical aids from outside. It is developed at home and arises entirely within itself. If the good seeks any portion of itself from without, it begins to be subject to the play of fortune. Chrysippus is also quoted in this letter. And Chrysippus is quite fascinating because he's widely seen as the second founder of Stoicism. Kind of like how we have Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, he's considered the second founder of Stoicism and he's quoted quite a few times in these letters as well. The letter then progresses on to say, We marvel at certain animals because they can pass through fire and suffer no bodily harm. But how much more marvelous is a man who has marched forth unhurt and unscathed through fire and sword and devastation. Do you understand now how much it is easier to conquer a whole tribe than to conquer one man? This saying of Stobo makes common ground with Stoicism. The Stoic also can carry his goods unimpaired through cities that have been burned to ashes, for he is self-sufficient. Such are the wounds, such are the bounds which he sets to his own happiness. So essentially, I mean, long story short, what he's trying to say in this, and, and obviously there's a lot of old English style language, is, is although you need people, you, sh you should also learn to be self-sufficient because self-sufficiency is in essence setting you free that you're not in reliance of others when you're in desperate need. Be, I, I think essentially what he's trying to say is needing others and having friendships should be something that's enjoyable and not something that you cling on to, that you need that. To keep you alive. He then the letter then progresses on to, to quote Epicurus again. He goes, Whoever does not regard what he has as most ample wealth is unhappy, thou he be master of the whole world. Or if the following seems to you a more suitable phrase, for we must try to remember the meaning and not the mere words. A man may rule the world and still be unhappy if he does not feel that he is supremely happy. In order, however, that you may know that these sentiments are universal, suggested, of course, by nature, and you will find in one of the comic poets this verse. 
unblessed is he who thinks himself unblessed. And, you know, also we could say, blessed is he who thinks he's blessed, right? So that's, I believe, the third and final lesson, which is the perception of feeling and, you know, gratitude that what you have is a fortune and having gratitude for what you already have right now and the perception of how you view yourself and your place in the world and your ability to do things that i believe is the basis of what this letter is having gratitude for your for what you have and how you feel about yourself then being able to be self-sufficient and finally which is the first uh, lesson is having those good religions to because it's good for us to be connected to people that we enjoy spending time with. So those were the three lessons from letter nine. Thank you for watching. Uh, if you learned anything from in, from this letter, then go ahead and like this video and comment below which idea you found to be the most valuable. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in letter 10.